CRFs. What's that? No CRFs. No CRFs? Yeah. That's like the best part of the class. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's not, it will not be an implementation uh, mini project. It will be, um, you can use whatever code base you want. Um, it will probably be doing some sort of mod generative model, uh, some sort of data. Yeah, you guys didn't like the CRF homework? That's like the best part of the class. Okay, uh, homework, homework six is significantly easier than the CRF. Uh, okay, so today uh, we'll, be t we'll start off with some useful properties about matrices. These will be useful for the homework. So in the homework, homework 6, you'll be asked in the first part to prove some properties about these SVDs, PCA, latent factor models. Uh, all the properties you really need to use will be the ones I cover in lecture. No need to go diving for obscure theorems in Wikipedia. Uh, a few students did that last year. There's no need to do that. The, everything you need to do can be just proven using manipulations of basic properties of SCD, basic properties of matrices, and some uh, inequalities and inequalities I'll be presenting in a couple of slides. Late factor models, not negative matrix factors. So just to recap, on uh, an orthogonal matrix U is uh, orthogonal, is called, or matrix uh, U is orthogonal if any column is a unit vector, also any row is a unit vector, and any two different columns are orthogonal to each other. A full ring orthogonal matrix, a square orthogonal matrix, maps onto the identity matrix if you multiply it by its transpose, so its transpose is also its inverse. And so you can think of U as a uh, norm preserving rotation matrix, and U transpose is simply the inverse rotation. So X prime equals U transpose X, so we rotate, if this is X, we rotate it according to, so that these axes are now the uh, canonical axes, right? Then you know, where you project along this line is simply the first coordinate, where you project along this line is the second coordinate, and you invert this rotation by simply um, trying to multiply x prime with e. Okay, so that's the definition of orthogonal matrix. Uh, any subset of columns of, of u to find a subspace. So, for example, you can, if, you can take the first k columns of u to define a k dimensional subspace, you're basically projecting uh, x down to k dimensions, so x prime has k coordinates. You can think of the coordinates as the uh, as then where you treat uh, the first k calls u as a new axis. Right? So one way of thinking about this is, is to think of it as a low rank subspace, or the original space. And if the data that you are modeling is inherently mostly low rank, then you can capture the majority of the variability of your data using a low rank subspace. And one way to find this low rank subspace is the singular value composition, which is arguably the most popular or common way of doing it. And the singular value composition basis is for any matrix X, where each column of X is a data point, and they're in data points. And again, if we could transpose this, you don't have to like transpose all the interpretations, but that's all, that's fine. But for now, let's add the column of X is a, is a data point. Then we can always find a decomposition of X into U, into an orthogonal matrix U, a diagonal matrix sigma, and an orthogonal matrix V. Transpose, and we transpose. Right. And the, a specific property of the SVD is that uh, typically when you call SVD in MATLAB or Python, the, the columns you get, the, the, the U's, V's, and sigmas that you get is sorted such that uh, the first K columns of U gives you the very best uh, K dimensional subspace that captures the most uh, variation of your data set. And what that is equivalent to minimizing the residual error if you try to reconstruct each data point using its projection. Right, recall that um, this, this is, uh, if this is, uh, if we're just projecting onto the one dimension, a single column vector, we get something that looks like this, and we're back projecting via something that looks like this, right? So this is the reconstruction of this data set using just one uh, SVD dimension, right? And the way that SVD is typically implemented, the first K columns of U gives the best data control. Compression and then reconstruction by this uh, level of point that you made. We also talked about PCA, principal component analysis, in the previous lecture. PCA is just takes a data matrix X and multiplies it by its transpose. So now you're looking at the feature covariance matrix of your data set, so how much individual features covary. And then it finds this decomposition of the same orthogonal matrix, 
view on both left and right and diagonal matrix lambda. Turns out that this is, uh, there's an equivalent for, for data set for S, for matrices that look like this, there's an equivalence between PCA and SVD, uh, like so. So these two U's are exactly, exactly the same U. And this uh, lambda is simply sigma transpose. Sigma squared, sorry, not transpose, sigma squared. So we applied this, in the, we saw an application of this in the previous lecture to, uh, to, to what's called eigenfaces. So each, each column of U is also known as an eigenvector. So eigenfaces. So here we took uh, every column is a dimension of a pixel, so 225,000. Uh, so every, every row is a, is a pixel location, so 225,000 rows. Every column is a face from this year's CS125 class roster portraits and last year's CS1. 55 class roster portraits. We decomposed this matrix into U, V, and then we folded the sigma into U and V by just left multiplying, right multiplying into U and V. So we get, so I call it U prime and V prime. And then if you visualize the columns of U, so there's K, so K or K equals 12, and if you visualize the columns of U, you get something, you get something that looks like this. Right? So these are the sort of the, the directions of most, variabil most variability in pixel space of CS125 class roster portraits. That this is just an application. Okay, so matrix norms. So there's two norms that are important in this class for matrices. One is the Frobenius norm, and the Frobenius norm is basically the square root of the square of every entry in the matrix. So you take this, you take it, you go otherwise of every entry in the matrix. You square, you take the square value of that entry. You sum it up and take the square root, and that is the Frobenius norm. It's equivalent, if you do the singular value decomposition of x, it's equivalent to just taking the sum of squares of, this, of these singular values. The trace norm is the, simply the sum of the singular values. And the singular values are guaranteed to be the non negative. So you could also do absolute value if you want, it doesn't change anything. And it's equivalent to uh, taking the trace of the square root of the matrix values itself. So these are the two norms that are important for this class. What are some properties of these matrix norms? Well, uh, the square for being this norm uh, can be modeled as this. So the trace of x transpose x is also known as the matrix dot product. Just like if, if x was a vector, column vector, x transpose x would just be a single number. And the trace of a single number is just that number back. So the trace doesn't do anything here. So this is a generalization of the dot product to matrices. Okay. And so this equals this, if we sort of write it out in, in, its, in its single value composition, which equals uh, this. This is just exploiting properties of traces. And it equals this. No. And you can also verify that the trace of this um, gives you this squared. Yeah? Is Eigenvalues of x is transpose. They are the eigenvalues. Sigma squared are the eigenvalues of x. X transpose. Sigma is the singular values of x. Of x itself. Yeah. But then there's no reason that they should be real numbers, right? Uh, singular values are. Singular values are always non-negative real numbers. It's a matrix. It's a matrix. I mean, for x x transpose, that's correct. But for a general matrix x. No, but because the singular values are the basic eigenvalues of x transpose, the square of the eigenvalues of x transpose x. I understand that this norm is the sum of the square values, uh, sum of eigenvalues of x, x transpose, but I'm saying if you take sigma i to the eigenvalues of x, they don't have to be real numbers. So the norm is squares are real numbers, so you can define that. But, but those are singular values. They have to be. I, I think the singular values have to be non negative. Symmetric. No, for any matrix, the singular values are necessarily. Eigen values aren't necessarily, but singular values have to be. Yeah. No, you get a polynomial that can have complex. There is one way to resolve this that does not require eigenvalues and singular values. Eigen values are not singular values. That's the definition of singular value decomposition. You can define this to be some of the more. 
All right, all right. No, no more, no more, no more debating. We're gonna just, uh, we're gonna find the back one. All right, here we go. Oh my, that'd be a very large one. <clears throat> Guaranteed to be non negative real numbers. That's wrong. It's wrong. It's Wikipedia. I have two PhDs in math, and yeah. I'm telling you that singular value of an arbitrary matrix can be a complex number. Even if M is uh, reals? Yeah, even if the matrix has real, uh, real entries. Okay. Um, can you post some Piazza? Can I post some paper? What? Can you post a description for us on Piazza? Okay, so let me, let me think about this. Let me think about this. Okay. So. And you can define. You can okay. Define. It, that, so so maybe you maybe the U matrix is is not doesn't have to be a real value. Is that it could no, be complex? No. 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 That's a definition of singular value. Yeah. I. It must I, be I, I, yeah. I've never. And you can you can make a definition and give a name to the norm square of eigenvalues of the matrix or singular values of the matrix. But the singular value itself can be. I mean, a rotation matrix has complex singular values. Two by two rotation matrix, rotation by nine. No, but no, singular values being negative would imply a norm to be negative. No, you see the norm, you can you define the norm to be sum of norm squared of singular values. That's, that's only the Frobenius norm. That's, that's only that's always the positive clear norm. But a singular value corresponds to a norm in some vector space. No, that's no. Because it's it's gonna be x transpose x. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um <laughs> Yeah, I'm happy it? for you to prove me wrong, uh, or prove prove what I've known for a long time to be wrong, because uh, I'm not. A, I don't. I don't. I've, I, 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 won't, I only use this stuff in, in my in my research. As far as I know, in virtually all basically all applications of SVD that I use it for, the sigma matrix is a diagonal of non-negative real numbers. Um, I've never seen an instance of it for SVD. Where that is not the case. Now, that, of course, is not a proof. No, um, everything you say is correct. I'm just saying that singular value of the matrix X itself can be a complex number, but it doesn't mean that here it will be a complex number. I'm just saying if you are defining sigma i to be singular values of X, they can be complex numbers, but that does not contradict everything you said. Anything but the definition of Wikipedia states explicitly that they are the non negative, they're non -negative, negative real numbers. Okay. <coughs> I'm happy to see a counterexample. I just um, I'm using the Wikipedia definition of singular value decomposition. Okay. Um, the trace norm, which is the other norm that is important in this class, uh, a little bit less important, but still important nonetheless, is these is equivalent to the sum of the singular values. And the way you derive it is. Um, It's, it's equivalent. Well, it's equivalent to all of these by, by, by modifying the value by, by, by using the using definition of the trace. In particular, uh, it's equivalent to this guy. Right, this is the, one of the definitions of a trace norm. The trace of the square root of x transpose x, which looks like this. So the Frobenius norm is the matrix version of the L2 norm that you guys have been looking at for a long time in this class. We use the L2 norm for two things, one for measuring squared loss in regression error, and one for measuring regularization, L2 regularization. Right. So if our model is, is matrix form rather than uh, vector form, right, the Frobenius norm is the generalization of the squared 2 norm uh, to matrices. And we'll be looking, and you know, yes, uh, last lecture we saw matrix valued uh, parameters, which is the U and V we estimated from the eigenfaces. Those are, you can do this as the parameters of your model. Uh, again, uh, if you want to regularize that, you would want to, using L2 norm as, as a regularization, you would use the Frobenius norm in the general case. So uh, before I talk about interpreting the, the trace norm, let's uh, think back to L1 and sparsity from the second week, of course. So uh, in a linear sort of weight vector, in a, in a single weight vector, not a matrix, a weight vector W is considered sparse, uh, sort of qualitatively, if it contains mostly zeros, right? 
And one way to write that is the L0 norm, right? Which counts the number of non-zero uh, elements in W. Now, we don't do L0 regularization with, with, if we want to train a sparse vector because it's not a continuous subjective function, right? It's discontinuous. It's flat and discontinuous everywhere. So we instead use L1, which is just basically the sum of the absolute values of W. And this is a continuous measure, so it's not discontinuous. So you can actually fit this into an optimization problem and optimize using gradient descent, and it, and it induces sparsity. So the trace norm is, you can think of it as the L1 norm over the eigenvalues of your matrix variable, matrix variant parameter model, model parameters. So suppose we wanted a, uh, a model parameter, X. Suppose X is our, is our parameter of our model and its matrix form. And we want, we want to regularize it to be low rank, right? To have few, which is equivalent to having few non-zero eigenvalues. So the rank of x is equivalent to summation over the eigenvalues, or the singular values, sorry. I should, I should have said singular values. Um, summation over the singular values, and counting the number of ones that are non-zero. Of course, this is not continuous, right? Just like in how L0 is not continuous. So we instead do a uh, L1 norm over the sum of those singular, singular values, and that is exactly what the trace norm is. So you can think of the trace norm, so the, so the trace norm is a way of inducing what's called spectral sparsity, which is basically I want, I have a matrix, va matrix variant parameter model, and I want that parameter matrix to be lower. So I, I, I do that by regularizing the trace norm of that uh, parameter matrix to be small. So here's some other useful properties of uh, matrices. Um, some of these are generalizations of, uh, of vector uh, vector algebra, like Cauchy Schwartz, where you mentioned mean inequality. Uh, so many, these are the these plus basic properties of SVD and uh, and traces and stuff like that is all you need for the homework. So just manipulate applying these in the right way will give you the solutions to the homework. So just a recap. <coughs> Um, SVD, definition of SVD, definition of PCA. The reason why this is sort of the, the main, the biggest reason why this is important is because we like to find a low dimensional or a low rank approximation of X such that it preserves most of the variability of X. That or, should be a yeah. What should be a, yes, thank you. It's been a long time. Right. Okay, <laughs> let's just move on before everyone else notices. Uh, I'll fix it after class. Um, Late factor models. So this is the meat of the uh, lecture today. Um, so this is the Netflix problem. Uh, it should look very familiar to the eigenfaces problem. We have m users, so each row is a user. We have n movies, uh, each column is a movie. And you know the, the actual which which is row, which is column doesn't really matter. Uh, this is I just use this uh, orientation uh, arbitrarily. And um, the, I, the hypothesis is that um, the variability of how users rate movies, like which movies you like, uh, is, lies in a, is most can be captured using a low dimensional model, a low rank model. Right? So y sub ij is the rating that a user i gives to movie j. Right? And we want to approximate this, right? compress this using uh, you know, rank K matrix U and rank K matrix B, where each uh, each row of U corresponds to a user, and each column of V transpose corresponds to a movie, and then the rating that user I gives to movie J is just uh, U I transpose B J. It's the inner product of the, the, one of these vectors and one of these vectors. So what does this what does this mean? This means that even though we just have this matrix of ratings. We, by doing this low rank decomposition, we've, we've actually learned a feature, a feature vector, if you will, for each movie and a feature vector for each user such that we can predict their ratings by a linear model over users and movies. So here's an example from the, uh, oh, this is uh, wrong, I thought I deleted that. It must not have synced with this Dropbox. Okay, so the main project 2 will not be this. Um, uh, this is from the original, or one of the original uh, Netflix papers where they learned, trained this latent factor model on the Netflix data uh, about 15 years ago now, it's a long time ago. 
Um, and so then they took a two-dimensional embedding of the or the top two um, the top two singular vectors, top two columns, and they visualized them. So um, so here are uh, visualizations of V. So V is a movie. So um, Braveheart is over here on the disc, over here, Lion King, and then over here. Okay. And then you know the way you think about how any particular user would like uh, would rate a given movie is you know suppose a user would had had a point here. This is Gus. Then Gus has a high uh, inner product with Independence Day because it's just the cos it's just the unnormalized cosine similarity between this vector and this vector. And so Gus would rate Independence Day highly. Gus would rate uh, the color purple very poorly. And so the reason why you know this visualization might make some sense is because if you think that uh, different movies, movies that are similar are rated similarly by uh, similar people, and, and people are similar because they like similar movies, then you can think of the location of each movie in this embedding, in this sort of visualization of, the, of, two, of a two-dimensional version of V as being indicative of what other movies it's similar to. And with that, we can start making some interpretations of what the axes mean. So for example, um, this is in the paper, they just sort of made an interpretation from visualizing these movies on a two-dimensional V, that movies over here are more geared towards females, you know, roughly speaking, approximately speaking. Movies over here are more geared towards uh, females, more serious on the top, um, on the upper movies, and more escapist on the lower movies. And again, these are just an uh, approximate interpretation from the visualization, but this is something that you can get out of this type of, uh, this type of model. And the basic idea is that we basically quote unquote learn a feature representation over movies, and now we're trying to see what each feature in the feature that they even corresponds to by visualizing it. Of course, the actual Netflix problem did not have a full parameter matrix, a uh, full observation matrix Y of every user rating every movie, and in fact, the vast majority of Y was missing, right? The vast majority of Y we didn't have data for. We only had data for a small fraction of it. But nonetheless, we still want to learn this model, right? So this problem is called, uh, so th uh, this problem of trying to figure out the missing values of Y is called collaborative filtering. This approach to collaborative filtering is called a latent factor model approach to collaborative filtering. So the collaborative filtering problem statement is there are n users, this is the most basic version of the statement, there are n users, there are n items, <coughs> we observe a small subset of user item pairs that have ratings. Most are missing, and the goal is to find some kind of model that can predict the missing values of this observation matrix. And this is applicable to any type of user item rating problem. Amazon, Pandora, Spotify, uh, so on and so forth. So the latent factor formulation is as follows. So we observe a bunch of labels and, and then the, some index, like this is the rating that user ID will be J, let's say, so it's labels. The goal is to learn a latent representation over users and movies such that um, their linear, their, the, the, a linear model over this latent representation can well approximate the observations that we do have. So this IJ sums over the training set, the training observations that we do have access to, and our goal is to find a U and B such that their inner product uh, matches the training observations that we do have and subject to regularization. Where K, where um, U, or the length of U and B, let's see, do I have a, uh, uh, nope, I don't have it. So, okay, so the length of U is, is, the, is the number of dimensions in your, uh, in your uh, uh, matrix decomposition. So if we do observe, if we did observe every entry in Y, then this is exact, this part of the problem is exactly the matrix decomposition problem in SVB. But we don't. We don't observe every entry in Y. And so we're just gonna try to make the hypothesis that there's some small number of features, a K, let's say, such that a K-dimensional vector can summarize every user in every movie, and then we would just fit that to the data we have, and hopefully that can help us make generalize to the rest of the missing values. <coughs> so there's a connection to the trace norm, the subjective function. So, 
Suppose we consider all u and v that could potentially achieve perfect reconstruction of y um, if y was completely filled in. And we want to find the u and v that has lowest complexity as measured by the two mode. Right? This, is, this formulation is actually equivalent to the trace norm of y. And you'll have to prove this in the homework. And here's how I actually gave you the proof in one direction. Um, so you just have to prove the other direction. Um, to prove uh, this is greater than this, you just, uh, you just posit that A equals this and B equals this, and then show that they're equal. And that gives you one direction. You have to prove the other direction uh, in, the, uh, in the homework. And again, just use the stuff I presented in the beginning of lecture. Don't need to get it too fancy. Okay, so let's interpret this latent factor model. Right? Here's the objective function, right? And you know, if, if I sort of use uh, this equivalence, right, then if I then if this objective function is very, very, very closely related to this objective function, right? I want to find a, a parameter matrix W such that yij is close to wij, but y, w but w the matrix w has low trace norm. Right? Because of, because of this equality, this is very closely related to this problem. And in fact, they're identical when, the, when the, if you were to solve this problem, whatever the rank of W was, you initially you have the rank of U and V be at least that large. So what does this mean? This is saying I want to find the best low rank approximation to Y. Yeah? If Y was completely um, Completely filled in. This is very similar. This is very closely related to the SPD, right? But here, y has missing values. Any questions on this? In fact, for this problem, you already specify the dimension of u and v. So typically in practice, you, spec you pre-specify the dimensions of u and v. Uh, so it's only equivalent if whatever dimensions you specify happen to be the same, uh, at least as large as the dimensionality of w in this solution. Otherwise, this equality doesn't hold. Right? Because uh, if u and v are of lower rank than w, then you cannot find it. In general, we cannot find a u and v that satisfies this equivalence. Right? This minimization problem is not feasible. Okay, so if you look at this optimization problem, there's actually a symmetry between, here between users and movies. Traditionally, uh, at least uh, the convention that we've, been, we've adopted for most of this class is that one side is the input feature input, and the other side is what we predict, right? Given a movie and a user, pr predict the rating for this user, right? So if v, if v is the input feature, U is our model, right? But there's actually in this problem, it's completely symmetric because of the fact that our prediction problem, well, one reason is, because, one way to interpret why is because our prediction problem is matrix variant, and we could treat any dimension of the matrix as the prediction problem. So we could say that each user is a feature vector, and each V is a model, because we want to learn, we want to predict for any given user whether or not this, uh, this movie is good for them, right? Normally, of course, we want to say for this given user, that's what they would use in, in the actual web application, for this given user, what are the movies that are good for it? But there's no way, reason why you can't flip it aside, flip it around mathematically, right? So if we knew v, then this problem is a linear regression to learn the u's, right? It's linear, just L2, least squares linear regression. If we knew the u, then this is linear regression to learn the v's, right? We just treat the u's as features. But the problem is completely symmetric from that perspective. Okay, so this is the optimization problem. So this, by the way, uh, is a non-convex optimization problem. So, um, you know, we, you know, what people do in practice is they uh, randomly initialize u and v, and they take the y's that they observe. Um, sometimes they, they, they do it like this, so they have this mask omega that, that masks y's that they don't care about so for uh, convenience of notation. Sometimes people just write for loops. Um, 
and, uh, and then they optimize using gradient descent. And because this is a non-complex optimization problem, uh, your initialization will lead you to different local optimal. But people just uh, people just deal with it. Sometimes you do random restarts, so you, so you reinitialize U and V to be a new random initialization, run this optimization problem three or four times, and then just pick the best one. And you can pick the best one via a validation set. It would be a common way to do so. You could also pick the best one by just visualizing them and see which one gives you a cleaner visualization. <coughs> Although I would not recommend doing that for your user to make predictions. And there's basically uh, two ways to optimize. Uh, one is gradient descent. The other one is alternating optimization. So if you treat, if you hold either U, if you hold U fix, this becomes a convex optimization problem. If that becomes at least linear, at least squares of regression problem, so there's a closed form solution. If you hold V fix, or if you hold U fix, the, the, uh, the, uh, the same is true for V. So if you hold either U or V fixed, all of U or all of V, you get a closed form solution for the other, and you can just alternate between the two. Right, so this is just a gradient calculation. You will have to derive this in the homework. Um, it's pretty straightforward, and then implement it. And you know, we set this gradient. So this is just for a single, uh, a single row of U, I guess. Either row or column of you, and then the closed form solution. If you set this gradient to zero, it's like this. And this is this gives you a closed form solution if you set the v if you hold the v space. Uh, gradient descent. You could do the standard stochastic gradient descent. Right? You could do alternating gradient descent. So a single data point here refers to um, just a single entry in the matrix. So here, there's a few different ways to interpret it. You could do the entire. You could do like uh, a single entry of the matrix. You could do a single row, a single column, uh, or, or you could just do the whole, the whole gradient, the whole thing at a time, which is this. Um, when you look at a single, so when you look at a single entry in the matrix, as Casimir you said, you could update both U and V. So if you look at, if you try to, if you look at uh, data point I J, you could either update U. You can update and update V, or just one or the other. It's so alternating SVGs just when you update just one and not the other. It doesn't really matter which one you choose. This is just, this is just alternating optimization, where you solve, where you can solve for each U or V optimally if you hold the others fixed. This is just the least squares closed form solution. So for reasonably small data sets, this, this tends to um, be the fastest. Yeah, let's talk about it here. For reasonably small data sets, this happens to tends to be the fastest because it it's much faster in terms of the number of iterations of the divergence. It does require inverting this matrix and summing over every entry in your in your training set, which can be slow. Creating a set is higher is, is better for higher dimensional problems. Just like in sort of the normal gradient descent we talked about in the first two weeks of lecture. Just another visualization. So um, for this one, uh, the, the authors of the so there was a I should mention a little bit of history. There was a machine learning competition called the Netflix Challenge about 15 years ago. Um, the Netflix in the Netflix Challenge, Netflix released a data set.